This video will provide a very brief introduction to the extremely wide-ranging topics included in basin analysis. Um, as you'll also see, um, sediments accumulate in low areas in the crust called sedimentary basins. And so the controls on the development of those basins are really important in influencing the vertical and the horizontal distribution of, of sedimentary facies. Basin analysis is an extremely broad and detailed field. It could be an entire course really on its own. Um, so we'll only touch very briefly on some of the basics to give you a flavor of what's possible. Uh, in class you'll get to explore basin formation in, in a slightly more quantitative way than we're going to cover in this video. So you've previously learned about base level and how cycles in base level create accommodation space or destroy accommodation space. In the simplest case, where these base level changes are caused by rising and falling sea level, or eustatic sea level, global sea level, the long run outcome doesn't result in any permanent creation of accommodation space for sediment storage. So unless other factors are changing, rising sea level or rising base level creates accommodation space allowing sediment deposition but then falling sea level destroys that accommodation space and erodes the sediments i'll also note that base level is, is a function of a variety of things including climate especially the climate the role that ener the climate has on energy in the environment but that's also not likely to create permanent accommodation space despite that sedimentary basins contain sediment columns that are kilometers, even tens of kilometers thick, like here in the Michigan Basin. Uh, the sediment here, or in sediment in pretty much any basin, accumulated over tens, or in this case, hundreds of millions of years. So you can probably guess that sea level is not rising by thousands of meters over tens of millions of years. So how do we get the accommodation space to accommodate or to, to hold all this sediment? Well, it's, it's subsidence. It's the physical sinking of the Earth's crust that's required to form a sedimentary basin where sediment can accumulate more or less permanently. In this graph here, the blue lines show subsidence rates. The horizontal line, the one with the arrow, um, is no subsidence. The crust, the level of the crust, the Earth's surface, remains in a constant position. The other two lines indicate 5 meters and 10 meters of subsidence occurring every 100,000 years. So every 100,000 years, the surface of the Earth at that point, surface of the Earth's crust, lowers by, say, 5 meters or 10 meters. The red lines are, like on the previous slide, base level curves. You can think of them also as relative sea level. They are a combination of this cyclical eustatic or global sea level and the subsidence that's going on. So in the lowest red curve, there's no subsidence at all. So you just get the cycles of base level oscillating up and down due to sea level. Um, in the higher level, in the higher two curves, base level still oscillates up and down, but there is a general increase over time due to that cyclical sea level plus the consistent subsidence. So the question that we're really going to ask, both in this video and especially in lecture, is what is causing the subsidence in the first place? What, and what controls the rate at which subsidence occurs? There are two main mechanisms that contribute to subsidence, or that contribute to uplift. And we're thinking about subsidence in terms of basins, but the converse of that is just uplift of the crust. So the first one, which is the most widespread, is isostasy, which you've learned about in, in previous courses. The topography or the elevation of the Earth's surface is affected by a couple factors. First, lithospheric density, and second is the, the thickness of the lithosphere. Uh, so denser, the lithosphere itself is floating on this liquid asthenosphere, the liquid upper mantle. Um, and if the lithosphere is denser, it floats somewhat lower on this liquid asthenosphere. So therefore, the elevation of the surface is, is lower compared to sort of an equivalent crust that's less dense. Lithosphere is also kind of like an iceberg floating on this asthenosphere, and so it, some of it sticks down into the, the mantle, and some of it sticks up. And so what this means is that thicker sections of lithosphere have a deeper root, but also have a higher surface elevation. So in this case, changes in the thickness of the crust, or changes in the density of the crust, can affect surface topography and therefore lead either to subsidence or to uplift.
The second physical mechanism that can drive subsidence is flexure. Flexure is just the bending or the warping of the crust due to the presence of a weight, generally called a load, sitting on top of a particular region of the crust. So that load could be a mountain range, for example. It could be a, a tectonic plate overriding the other plate. Um, or it could even be a giant pile of sediment itself. There's a feedback where once you add sediment, it causes the crust to flex a bit, which creates more accommodation space for more sediment to accumulate. So in class, we're going to investigate isostasy and flexure in a slightly more quantitative ma manner, but for sort of a broader context, I need to introduce some terminology for describing sedimentary basins. Basins can form in stable continental interiors, but the vast majority of them are located near plate boundaries or in areas of active plate tectonics. Basins can form due to extension, which is sort of rifting or spreading of the crust. They can form due to convergence, where two plates collide, like in the subduction zones shown here, or in continent, continent collision zones. Or they can form due to strike-slip faulting, where the two plates are moving laterally you know, beside each other. So extension, the splitting or the, the separation, the rifting of a plate, um, creates basins that are generally called rift basins. On this diagram, it shows a couple factors. First is the sort of horizontal direction is schematically at least something called the extensional strain rate. The strain rate is just the rate at which the two pieces of crust or lithosphere are moving apart. Um, when the amount of and I guess, that's sort of the, sorry, the vertical axis is, is what they call the stretch factor. That's just the total amount at which the crust, crust or the lithosphere is, is stretched. A factor of one means you know, no stretching. A factor of three means it's stretched to three times its original width. So when the amount of, of extension is relatively small, you can get various flavors of rift basins, like this continental rift, the super detachment basins, sort of depends on the geometry of, of the faults, but they're all rift basins. And as the amount of extension, or as the, the stretch factor increases, uh, this rift may transition to something called a passive margin, which coincides generally with the onset of ocean crust formation from the, from the asthenosphere. In these rift basins, the subsidence is driven primarily by isostasy, through a combination of crustal and, and lithospheric thinning, and also by changes in, in the heat flow. The extensional strain rate, the rate at which the crust pulls apart, has plays you know, a, an important role on the subsidence, as does the thickness of the lithosphere. So, as I mentioned, there, there is this transition as you get increasing extension from a rift, potentially to a passive margin, which is sort of like the east coast of North America, or these continental margins where there's no active plate boundary. Um, and the transition between those two, between the rifting part and the passive margin part, is generally called the rift to drift transition. It's approximately the transition from sedimentation in these sort of confined rift basins at the bottom to more broadly distributed post-rift or passive margin sediments. That transition is often marked by something called a, a breakup unconformity, the green line in the diagram here, uh, which is related to the onset of seafloor spreading. There are also a lot of basins formed in convergent plate boundary settings, uh, and in this case, the subsidence is primarily caused by flexure, where the underlying plate bends under the weight of the overlying plate, under the weight of, of mountain ranges formed by the continent-continent collision in those sort of cases. So in subduction zones where the ocean crust is going underneath um, other ocean crust or primarily continental crust, you get basins called forearc basins. They develop on the seaward or the oceanward side of the volcanic arch, a, a volcanic arc above the trench. So in California, the Cretaceous sediments of this Great Valley group are, were deposited in a forearc basin on the ocean side of the Sierra Nevada arc. Sort of the block diagram in the lower right schematically illustrates that. In continent-continent collisions, what typically develops is a mountainous fold and thrust belt, where there are folding of the rocks and these, these faults called thrust faults, where rock is thrust above other, other slices of, of, of crust. 
And so in this case, the overriding crust, this mountain range formed by this fold and thrust belt, causes flexure in the underlying plate. And this leads to a basin called a foreland basin. And that's on the landward or the inland side of the collision area. In the western North America, the Mesozoic Western Interior Seaway is at least partially a foreland basin developed in response to this fold and thrust tectonics in the Rocky Mountains. So because foreland basins are formed primarily by flexure, they are deepest near the mountain front, the mountains being the weight that causes the flexure, so they flex the crust more close to where the weight is located. A foreland basin can be marine, like the Persian Gulf today is a foreland basin shown here. In the depth profile on the right, it has this typical depth profile. It's deepest on the north or northeast side, closest to the active mountain, the active fold and thrust belt in, in Iran. Foreland basins can also be terrestrial. It really depends on the balance between sedimentation and subsidence. If sedimentation rates are high or subsidence rates are low, um, the basin will fill up with sediment and will become a terrestrial or a non-marine basin. But if sedimentation rates are lower than subsidence, the basin may remain marine in, in, this, in this case here. Finally, we'll just discuss very briefly strike-slip basins. Uh, these are small basins, typically pretty small basins, that may develop along what are called releasing bends in strike-slip faults. That's a pull-apart basin. Or they may develop where there are gaps between closely spaced strike-slip faults. And these are called fault overstep basins. Uh, in the block diagram here on the left, it shows a, a pull-apart basin. There's a left lateral strike-slip fault, and because of this bend, it tends to open up a small gap as the fault moves, creating this sort of lozenge or trapezoid-shaped basin. Uh, the San Andreas Fault is really well known for creating numerous present-day as well as ancient pull-apart as well as fault overstep basins, as well as you can find these on pretty much any strike-slip fault system. Like in the right-hand diagram, shows the in Turkey, the Sea of Marmara is a, one of these fault overstep basins along the North Anatolian Fault. Strike-slip basins often contain non-marine sediments, um, but they can develop as far as, as the onset of marine conditions, like you see in the Sea of Marmara. Um, because these basins are, are typically very small, they lose heat really efficiently. And as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, hotter crust is more buoyant. It tends to ride higher in the in the lithosphere or in the asthenosphere, and so therefore subsidence is governed by the bounding faults. There's no heat to keep it up, and so uh, subsidence rates are typically extremely high in pull-apart basins or strike-slip basins in general. So because of that extreme rate of subsidence, accommodation space is created so rapidly that facies just aggrade upwards and they can't even prograde out over the basin. And as a result of that, lateral facies transitions can be very abrupt in a lot of pull-apart basins. This block diagram shows kind of a cartoon of, of the facies in the ridge basin, a Miocene pull-apart basin in Southern California. There are actually spectacularly coarse-grained alluvial fan deposits along the formerly active fault scarp on the left, the San Gabriel Fault, but they grade laterally into fine-grained sediments over the span of only a few hundred meters or a couple kilometers. Sediment is supplied from these active basin flanks, the uplifted basin sides, um, but very little of that sediment will actually make it into the middle of the basin. It gets trapped at the margins in this rapidly created accommodation space. So therefore, the basin center can be what's called sediment starved because there's almost no sediment makes it there. The rates of sediment accumulation are super low. So therefore, it's often a, a lake environment, a lacustrine environment, but it can also be a marine environment.